Welcome and thank you for joining us for episode 20 of Webster Speaks, Dialogues on Race, Equity, and Inclusion. I'm your host, Vincent Flewellen, coming to you from the Media Commons studio at Webster University. Today we're talking about women. March is Women's History Month. While we honor the countless contributions of women to get where we are today, we also need to talk about how much further we have to go to achieve true equity and equality especially for women of color. With me to discuss it are Desiree Coleman Fry. She is a returning expert on Webster Speaks. She is a diversity, equity, and inclusion executive and founder of Women Work Well. She's a tireless advocate for working mothers and women of color. Anne Garrity Rathard is an attorney and a professor in the Department of Law, Crime, and Social Justice at Webster University. She also teaches in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program. Anne is also the director of the Willow Project, where she represents wrongfully convicted female prison inmates. Also joining us is Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper, another returning guest to our show. She is a psychologist in private practice at Emergent Psychological Services in St. Louis, and also program director of the Applied Educational Psychology Program at Webster University's School of Education. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Nice to be here. Glad to have you. Thank you. So I'm going to start off with this question to all of you. Uh, what do you think are some of the most pressing issues right now for all women, especially during the pandemic? Who wants to go first? Well, I guess being in healthcare, I would have to say mental health mm -hmm. has been huge for the past two years, to the extent that all of the providers that I know in the local area are really kind of stressed, stretched and burnt out um, because we didn't see the demand coming as quickly as it did. Um, it was the pandemic in addition to Black Lives Matter that kind of happened back to back and it just made a lot of people who traditionally don't reach out for mental health services start to reach out. So um, it's been a big, big issue that COVID of course and mental health have been really big. Thank you. I think trying to balance the struggles of maintaining a sense of normalcy amidst a global pandemic. So when you think about the role that women play in caregiving, uh, showing up at work, again, you mentioned the, the rise in racial justice issues. It becomes a lot to try to adjust to a new normal um, in the wake of a pandemic. And, and to sort of piggyback off of that, I, I think uh, one of the biggest and most pressing issues is that what I've really discovered, uh, to my chagrin, is that um, gender roles are alive and well. Um, and I think that's what the pandemic has, has reinforced once again, the idea of the second shift where for a long time historically, uh, women have you know, not only worked outside the home in their professions, but also been in charge of almost everything within the home in terms of care of children, you know, preparation of food, all the traditional things. And that second shift has been there for a long time. But now during the pandemic, we sort of saw the first shift and the second shift blend. And the, the long-term impact on people's careers, I think, is going to be huge. They're, you know, they're already estimating that um, you know, the wage gap that exists for women has been set back about another 20 years. So, um, you know, that's going to be significant and, and how it's going to impact people's lives and careers going forward. Can I, can I jump on Please. that? So we talk about the first shift and the second shift. So the idea that women go to work every day, show up and do a great job, come home, care for, uh, or the, usually the primary caregivers in the home, for women executives, leaders, business owners, now they're talking about the third shift, which is you put the kids down to bed, then you lock back on to finish the work you weren't able to finish throughout the day. So when you talk about mental health, when is there an opportunity to rest when all of the demands are, are so prevalent? Yeah, I summed it up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so Malcolm X uh, in 1962 said, the most disrespectful person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. This sadly remains true 60 years later. So let's consider Supreme Court nominee uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson. She is an 
inspiration to many women, but particularly black women, of course, but also subjected to the scrutiny that President Trump's nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, was not. Who cares what Judge Jackson's LSAT score was, right, many years ago? Uh, and since, of course, she's had this stellar career. Uh, Jackson went to Harvard. Barrett is the only justice who did not attend any Ivy League uh, law school. Very troubling. Uh, what would you all say in terms of response to that? I think this idea of caring for black women is a theme that you see come through in like our healthcare outcomes. So I think about the black maternal women's health crisis and the rate at which women attempted to bring forth life um, are on par with many developing nations. And it is talked about in some circles, but it is not a national focus the way that it should be because it's affecting a broad piece of our our segment. And so it does beg the question, who truly is sort of um, offering that care, that assurance for black women? So I think it is something to kind of keep in mind. I think it's interesting that <laughs> The focus has been on some facets of her training, education, and background, and not on other things like the big thing with um, Amy was the motherhood. Wow, she has this many children. She's able to balance it all. She's done this, that, and the other. And true, yeah, and I, I only imagine what that is like to balance that many children. But at the same time, Jackson has children as well. No one has brought that up. And to be a woman of color in this society and to achieve the things she's done probably has taken 200% of whatever it takes Amy to do whatever she's done. So the focus should be on those things and how she's been able to overcome those as well as discrimination, intersectionality, but that's not the, the conversation we're having. You mentioned the fact that as, as a black woman to have achieved the level of success in which she has mm -hmm. achieved, must have required her to work, I think you said something, 200% more or something like that. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yes, it's something when I, I taught a, I think a feminist psychology class years ago, undergrad, and um, I remember telling my students that if a woman of color gets to the same career places that a woman that is not of color gets to, trust it has taken her 200% of the hard work to get there because she's going uphill the whole time. She's going against discrimination, against sexism, against whatever else, SES challenges she might have as well. So what happens is when these women get to these positions, then like this case, we see that she's being judged and saying, oh, she's, she's subpar, she's not as, as good. But in reality, what actually happens is the women of color are stellar compared to their counterparts because they've had to be. Because when they're looked at uh, with white women, of course, like if they're re reviewing resumes to get them the job, they're going to be like, oh, she's not that good. But in reality, she's done this much to get there because she's she's had to. She's had she knew like just like in my family growing up, my parents told me to be two, three times as good. So we have this history and pattern of being so much better. And then on top of that, we have the resilience, the work ethic, the independence of thought that it takes to succeed in corporate American education. But none of those things are ever considered even though this person is qu probably quite more qualified than Amy and probably some of the people before her. Thank you. Either of you want to add? I was just going to say that that is so absolutely true. So here is this Judge Jackson who has just a stellar record um, as a judge and, you know, and she went to Harvard. And yet, you know, all, all those things, working twice as hard to get to where she is. And then all of a sudden that is nothing, right? That not, is nothing. Now she has to start over to prove her worth, even after this vast career of wild success. Again, she's, she's, you know, being marginalized. You know, now she has to prove once again to people that she's worthy uh, based on her LSAT score, which is not indicative of anything, especially not for, for anyone who's not a white male. The LSAT score is far less predictive than it is for white males, and that's because law school was set up for white males. Those were the only people who could go, but law school hasn't changed. So the LSAT score doesn't reflect how people do in law school or in the profession of law, unless perhaps they're white males. So to even ask such a question of anyone is 
completely bogus, but to ask it of someone who has achieved something that no one else has achieved, literally, both literally and figuratively, is, is the ultimate slap in the face. I would just say that it really is disheartening that you know, we're still achieving first because you would hope right. that we got into a place where the playing field would, would be level and equal access and opportunity would be pervasive. Um, and so I'm just going back to the original quote and I keep thinking about um, the way that black women's bodies are sexualized, the way that you know we're viewed with like atrocious stereotypes as being like the help. And so the idea of a woman being competent and capable and qualified constantly comes up against bias. And so I think that's what we're seeing here, unfortunately. You know, I do think it's interesting. You think about Judge Jackson, and I believe Judge Jackson served as a clerk to... Justice Breyer. Justice Breyer. Yeah. Uh, the, the seat in which she is said yes, to be placed, absolutely. right? And again, I think to, to your point, Jamika, and all of your points in, in all honesty there, the fact that there's this intersectionality of not only experiencing sexism as a woman, but also experiencing the discrimination as a black woman and those two things coming together. And so for her to rise to the position of Harvard, so I think she was the editor of the yeah, Harvard Law, Law Review, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, to then be in this position where she also ultimately ends up being the clerk for the seat in which she is actually up for nomination should just blow our minds in terms right. of her credibility and her uh, readiness and preparedness for such a role, right? But because of, again, those two inter inter intersections coming together right. through this lens of racism and sexism, we now see that she, as you said, she's having to start back over and, right. and qualifying she, herself. I mean, literally, every check mark that anyone would ever want in a Supreme Court justice and more and still they're subjecting her to those kinds of questions. It's just absolutely demeaning and, and horrifying. I, it really is. But it's not surprising. No, it's not surprising. It's not surprising. I'm even thinking about the Olympics and the brouhaha we saw with Shakari Richardson mm -hmm. and then sort of a different course of action with the Russian figure skater. So I do think, Jamika, what you said, this idea that um, being good usually is not good enough. Mm -hmm you are required to be exceptional at everything that you do, um, to persist in the face of microaggressions, to um, you know, smile even when people are mistreating you, and then still to bring your A game, mm -hmm. right? And so that is an unfortunate reality that I think many professional women of color, especially black women, have to face. Thank you. So I'm curious to know what our audience thinks about the state of women's equality. Our moderator, Igo Akakate, talked to women around campus to get some opinions in a segment we call Ego Trips. One of the main things I want to see is in jobs that are basically in the past been known as masculine jobs like firefighters, police officers, those kind of jobs. And I'm a former police officer, uh, 25 years um, retired. I would like to see that women be able to use their strengths in those fields as opposed to our um, characteristics being thought of as a weakness. And a lot of times women come, on, come into those fields and they feel like they have to act like a man and portray the qualities of a man and things like compassion and um, uh, empathy are looked upon in those fields as weakness. And so when, when, in, when in reality, those would be a strength in those positions. One of the main changes I wanna see is the pay gap that still exists um, between men and women. And I also want to see more women being at the top of businesses, like in the corporate world. Um, I think 
all, every avenue in life is about creating relationships and I just think being a woman even though they say one of our weaknesses is being emotional, I think our emotions and us being emotional, emotional creatures allows us to create relationships better. Whether it be as the CEO or whether we're the janitor, I just think we have a better ability to create relationships and honestly that's how you keep your workers. So that's probably the biggest change that I would like to see between men and women. Right now, I think I would love to see men empathizing with women's issues and understanding what they're going through. And I think if they see an unfair treatment in the workplace or just other men speaking poorly about other women, that they should speak up. A lot of the time, men don't speak up on issues and that leaves women without the power to spread awareness. Um, I would love to see in the workplace that superiors are giving men, women, and people of all gender identities the same benefit of the doubt regardless of how they identify, male, female, non-binary, gender fluid, otherwise, that if you're practicing one behavior, it's treated the same regardless of who you are and your status. What are your reactions to this? I think there's some, some really good comments I think the one that stuck out to me was about the emotions. So making it so that emotions like um, sadness, compassion, kindness are not seen as being typically female emotions, but that everyone feels comfortable expressing those. Um, and you know, that's kind of what is at the underneath of this whole concept of toxic masculinity, men not being able to show emotions except in certain areas and then they go overboard, right? So I think uh, I definitely agree with that. Um, I hope as time goes on and parents are doing, like we said before, gender roles are different. Men are doing more parenting responsibilities and then they can model how it, it looks like to express those emotions and not be seen as, as weak. The more that happens, the more people talk about it and get comfortable with it. Um, I'm hopeful that it'll change over the years or generations possibly. What stuck out to me was the pay equity issue, and so ensuring that women are uh, fairly compensated for what they bring to the table and the work that they do, and also this idea of women being at the top of the food chain. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, for many, many years, women of color in the C-suite was like 1.3%. Um, great to see uh, Tashanda Duckett-Brown, you know, being named CEO of TIAA, and then you know, certainly Walgreens and other corporations, but I do think there's room to see um, those positions of power occupied by women and also women of color. And what makes me happy about it is I think that, you know, people have had all these experiences and felt all these, you know, sort of systems of oppression, but I think more recently we've had, you know, the recognizable words in society and, and ways to, you know, to understand it. So the personal experiences of people for which there perhaps weren't any outlets or, or no recognized um, language. Um, you know, as they were speaking, I was thinking, these are very well-informed people who have lived experiences, but now we all sort of have the language to understand what those lived experiences are. And I think that is really a powerful thing. Um, and, that, and, you know, that's what struck me. I'm like, you know, what they're speaking is their truth. and. We're starting, maybe just a little bit, not nearly enough, but just starting to, to have words and, and language that is common among everyone, even the privileged people among us, as myself, to, to be able to understand some of that more. Thanks. So, Dr. Cooper, um, there's been a lot of uh, recent research that talks about this idea of the black woman being superwoman. Can you first talk about what that means, and then talk a little bit in terms of the, 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 the stress and the toll that that actually might then have on black women or women of color. Um, well, the superwoman, they call it in the research, lots of different things, schema, role, and it goes all the way back to some of the earlier pioneers of women's rights, earlier women of color pioneers of women's rights. Um, some of the readings that have been out probably 20, 30 years, and they've kind of put us into groupings of what we are most likely um, categorized as, right? So Superwoman being one of them. Uh, Mammy is one of the other ones, if you think back on some of the older movies. But what that means for black women is that, so then we take on these, if you can imagine, a superhero with a cape. 
and um, or Marvel characters and the fact that they often don't have flaws or weaknesses unless it's their one flaw, right? Um, but usually they can do everything. So with this superwoman ideal or schema, then black women then strive to do things like um, show strength all the time, mm -hmm. literally all the time, um, suppress emotions, um, say yes to everything. So what I see in, in practice are women who have a tendency to people please and and never turn anyone down. They feel like they have to take care of everyone um, and they have to continue and despite all of these things that they may come against. So it's this whole idea of you persist throughout these things but you never show any sign of weakness. And that while on one hand it's very great, it's been quite good for us survival. Mm -hmm. um, we've survived, we've come through generations out of slavery, civil rights, and so that part is good. I don't wanna downplay that, but the bad parts of it is that it shows up in our physical health and our mental health. So I see women every day in therapy that are dealing with these things because they cannot do them. So once you've been trained and reared to not show emotion, you, get to the point where what I see sometimes with my patients, they can't even identify emotions. So even if they were sad, they would not know it because mm -hmm. they've gone 30, 35 years of never showing an emotion. They don't even know, they wouldn't even know how to name the emotion. Mm -hmm. So it just gets to the, the point where suppressing things is all held internally and that's where we see a lot of this chronic stress other health issues and I'm sure some of the other things we'll talk about today, but overall it's bad, but that's the superwoman schema that a lot of black women strive to be or that have been raised to be and they don't know anything different. Let me also ask you really quickly before I move on to, to our other guests with a couple other questions. This idea of women and pain and tolerance uh, within the medical uh, community, could you speak a little bit about that as well? Uh, yes, it's you talk to people, especially around COVID-19, I'm sure you've all talked to people that um, about the vaccine, about the disease itself. People have a lot of irrational beliefs about the medical system. Sometimes people have very rational <laughs> beliefs about the medical system, but a lot of it is kind of steeped in mistrust, right? So um, there have been some studies that have been done over the years that have shown when they looked at medical stu students, medical school students, they've shown that they actually do believe in self-report instruments that black people experience less pain. So what does that mean for them in the medical profession? These people are probably now out practicing, but if you're going to see a doctor and you're an African-American person and you tell them, hey, I'm experiencing this pain, this back pain or uh, abdomen pain, and you're black, they might just look at you and say, hmm, oh, you can deal with it. Or they will minimize it, ignore it, dismiss your concerns. Or if it's some type of chronic pain like back pain, we see this a lot um, unfortunately, many people who suffer from back pain are on um, opiates, so that's why people get addicted. But doctors will see patients, one white patient, one black patient, for the same exact chronic pain issue, give the white patient a month's supply of Oxy, give the black patient five Oxy, mm. because you don't experience pain in the same way. So this is a real belief that some medical professionals um, have it as far as implicit bias. I know we've all talked about that, but um, so, and it doesn't have to be based on race, age, geographic location. If this is something that medical professionals believe, this is a problem. Thank you. Desiree, you're an advocate for uh, working black mothers. Uh, what, what would you want people to understand about that experience? And yeah, so I would go back to what Dr. Jamika talked about, the super, the superwoman archetype, like the strong black woman archetype, that is dead. <laughs> it is a fallacy and I think it is a really harmful stereotype. So, you know, what I always try to say is that women and women of color are full beings. Like we've experienced a full range of human emotions, sadness, frustration, disappointment. And so when you think about from a workplace, the things that make that workplace great and excellent is that it's an equitable workplace, mm -hmm. right? That uh, microaggressions are not tolerated, that bad behavior from managers is not accepted. And so I would say understanding and seeing people's humanity is really important. And so as you think about, I know earlier, 
um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many managers were business as usual, assigning the exact amount of work, not giving any regard to, you know, you're now a referee, you're now a short order cook, you're now a classroom teacher, and that demand that has increased exponentially. So um, seeing the full person means understanding and recognizing everything that they're bringing into the table. I don't believe in the fallacy of bring your whole self to work uh, because I think that um, many organizations are not set up to fully experience that. Yeah. But I think it's important for leaders and managers to, and organizations to think about the full breadth of their employees and what they experience on a day to day basis. Do you think that women of color have a different uh, when you talk about bringing your full self to work? Are there a different cert, a set of um, identity pieces that they're bringing that maybe some of their white female colleagues are not having to consider? So there's an amazing TED talk by Jody Ann Burley, and I'm sure you've seen it. And it's just this idea that like bringing your full self to work means your trauma, your experiences, um, maybe a different way that you want to dress or present yourself, right? Um, that organizations may have a very narrow box of what they define as professional and what they deem to be appropriate and acceptable for the workplace. And so for many women of color, it is making trade-offs, right? You talk about psychological safety at work. And so if you experience something that's unpleasant, that you believe is unfair, you have to make a calculated decision. Am I going to bring this up? Do I have enough political capital to sustain me? Do I have enough allies and supporters within my organization who will back me up? if there is blowback. And so I like to call that the mental Olympics. Mm. Um, so you are constantly negotiating um, in addition to doing your job, in addition to smiling and, you know, um, you know, being a, being a great team player. And so I do think that there is an added burden. Catalyst, which is the um, international think tank, calls that the emotional tax, right, of being a person of color in the workplace. So absolutely, there is an additional burden. Thanks. And you work with incarcerated women through the Willow Project. What toll does wrongful incarceration take on society as well as on the family? Uh, well, I mean, one interesting aspect of, of you know, mass incarceration generally is that the incarceration of women is growing almost at 2.5% of the rate of, of male mass incarceration. So any mass incarceration, of course, is terrible. But female uh, mass incarceration is growing at a much faster rate. And, um, and, and yet we still have a lot of disparities in the, the kinds of resources that are allocated for, uh, for people um, who are you know, in women's prisons. And so one of the, you know, one of the issues that, that a lot of people face is the idea that um, of, of all women who are in prison, um, like, uh, let me look at my, uh, my numbers, 80% or 60% of women in prison are mothers. And of that 60%, 80% are mothers of children under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we have this, this huge number of people being incarcerated um, and for reasons that, you know, I think come back to a lot of the things that both of you are saying, um, you know, this, this sort of hyper focus on people, um, especially women of color, then we have the, this mass incarceration rate, which also destroys families. So we have children um, who are, you know, without parents. We have society without, you know, family structures that are needed. Um, and then, you know, the resources are so small. So, for instance, in Missouri, we only have two women's prisons, and we have like 10 or 12 men's prisons. And what happens is the two women's prisons are on the opposite sides of the state. Hmm. And so you go to the one, in theory, anyway, the pandemic has even made that impossible. But you go, in theory, to the one that's closest to where your family is. But if there's one not near St. Louis and there's one near Kansas City, all the other women in the state are very, very far away from their family members. And because of poverty and a lot of other issues, it makes it difficult for families and children to travel, to see their mothers in prison. And, and you know, so then, you know, the, the isolation of the people who are in prison, but also the impact on society of... Um, the breakdown of, of these very important relationships and, and you know, the, the, the trauma that that instills in, you know, everyone. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's horrific, um, to say the least. And, you know, every time I go to prison, which I was in prison last week, I, ju I just um, fear for the whole world because of the impact of it. So. 
Thank you. Um, Desiree, one glaring uh, issue, and we heard uh, our audience talk a little bit about this in terms of the, the inequities of, uh, the, of pay and the wage gap that still exists. Um, I believe for every dollar a white man earns, uh, women overall earn 83 cents. For black women, it's 63 cents. And for Hispanic Latino women, it's 54%. What suggestions do you have in terms of being able to close that gap? Hmm. Well, one that is fairly simple, it's pay women more, full stop. <laughs> um, and I do appreciate Equal Pay Day that focuses on closing that gender wage gap. Um, and now we see black women's equal pay day. So that means that it took all the way until August of the following year for black women to earn the same amount as white men earned the year prior and for Latinas, Equal Pay Day, Latina Equal Pay Day is October 21st, which is essentially almost into the next year. And so I really do think um, as we look at how jobs are resourced and rated, um, I think it's great for organizations to do a pay equity study to ensure that women are able to um, not disclose their income when they're applying for a job. Um, many states, including New York, have made that um, you know, sign that into law that you can't, you cannot ask a woman what she makes. And I think that those sorts of practices help women better negotiate and um, advocate for themselves. And ultimately, it's not just about the woman. So Vincent, there's actually a study by the Federal Reserve Board of San Francisco that said closing the gender and racial pay gap would result in a $2.6 trillion boost to GDP. So that's definitely something we should be looking at. And do you think that there's a difference between, uh, I know we focus here primarily on, on white men in comparison to women of color, but white women in comparison to women of color, is there a gap that exists there? There's a gap across the board. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the studies I've seen said that women as a whole were about 87, so we're 82, 87. I'm sure it fluctuates year to year, but what that says is for the same job, for the same work, women are not being paid at the same level. And that is antithetical when you think about fairness, equity, equality, which I know is a theme today. Thank you. So, Jamika, uh, we talked at the beginning about the pandemic uh, and about the lack of services available uh, to black neighborhoods and to, especially to women. Uh, what has changed? Very little. <laughs> Very little has changed. In the pandemic, um, if we look at the St. Louis area, even less than little has, has changed. Um, mental health has been, you know, what it is. And like I said before about the demand has just increased so fast. I don't think cities or um, my career field has been able to catch up. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, it was nothing that anyone planned on. Um, so in St. Louis, we do have a couple of community centers where people can go. We used to have a psychiatric center that held a lot of people, did a lot of services, but we no longer have that. So now people are being funneled into other places. This is in St. Louis is very typical of other urban areas. So when the psychiatric centers, inpatient facilities are taken away, then people get funneled into ER. So they go to ER, urgent cares. They end up in nursing homes or prisons. Um, and that's where they end up getting their mental health care. And many of these places don't even have like consistent mental health care. So that happens as far as access for black women. But when you look at mental health and psychotherapy as a whole, access really means providers. And we have to do something about have increasing the number of providers, that's one, increasing the number of providers that look like me so that people who look like me can go seek services um, the numbers say that out of all the psychologists in the country, only 5% of them are black. Mm. Um, that's a low number if you look at the numbers of African Americans in the country. So many times African Americans seek other African Americans to, to be their provider. So if that's possible, great. If not, then you're going to go to a non-person of color for a therapist and that person is sometimes not culturally sensitive to what your issues and needs are. So they could be totally oblivious to the socioeconomic factors that, that impact your life, such as transportation, such as childcare, such as being a single parent, and what that looks like and what that means as far as when you could even meet 
for a session. Those type of things matter as far as access to black women. So even if you have insurance, right, there are such things as co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles. At what point in the year do you meet your deductible? Co-pays can be expensive. Sometimes I see patients who have co-pays that are up to $100. Mm. And I'm thinking, is this really, a, that's a copay? That is not the cost, that is it's what they have to pay. Right. Right. So that is a factor. That is something that people have to deal with and overcome if you can't, even if so people, I always hear this, well, you have insurance, so just go get therapy. As if it's that easy, it's not that easy. You have to be covered for a certain amount of sessions. So there are just so many obstacles that get in the way of black women being able to receive the mental health treatment they need. And then I haven't even touched on cultural factors, such as the stigma associated with getting therapy mm -hmm. as a black person. Mm -hmm. Like we all know like what that's been like. Uh, um, I went to graduate school over 20 years ago. When I went to graduate school, everybody in my family was like, we don't know what you're doing and why, this is stupid. You can't even write prescriptions. You can't help anyone. Black people don't do therapy. And mm. now fast forward, like 25 years later, black people are doing therapy or they're trying to, but we don't have the number of providers. So lots of issues. Thank you. Thanks. And I want to ask you a quick question um, here, and that is you just recently returned from the southern border. Uh, can you tell us what's going on there for women and children right now? Yes, I, it's, it's such a complicated uh, picture, so multifaceted. Um, so we go uh, there, a group of people from Webster students and faculty, and we work with an organization that's already there called Arise, and they've been there for you know, like 30 years. Um, and what an incredibly empowered uh, group of women leaders they are, uh, you know, we're just in awe of them and just trying to, you know, fill whatever gaps we can, but they're amazing and do it all themselves, really. We just show up and, and do what they need us to do. Um, but... Uh, you know, the, the, all of the things that we're saying, of course, are true um, at, at the border as well. There are um, people living right along the Texas and Mexico border who are essentially living in what we think of as non-industrialized country conditions, right? So um, people who are living in cinder block houses without plumbing and water and electricity and environmental uh, contamination that affects their lives every day, high rates of cancer and, mm. um, you know, miscarriage uh, among uh, the community because of all the, the contamination. And, and what contributes to that, there are, there are many people who are still living, who are living in the community who are um, U.S. citizens. Also, we have undocumented people. Also, we have other people who are in various stages of of immigration or on, you know, like trafficking visas and all sorts of other things. And they're looking out for the entire community, which is incredible, but it's just almost an insurmountable workload for, um, for this organization to, to try to keep track of all of the, the moving parts. So, um, you know, just while we were there, we were, we were talking to people, um, you know, and, and in particular, just to, to focus for a minute on undocumented people, um, there are a lot of uh, issues like women, um, children who are in, employed in full-time jobs and not attending school because of the fear that you know their their whole family is going to be traced. Um, people not accessing health care because you know during a pandemic because of of, the, of those same kinds of fears and um, distrust. And and then we have you know all kinds of gendered um, working conditions that are are. Horrifying too, you know. Um, you know, employers employing males in more high-paying jobs and women in lower-paying jobs that are very stereotypical in terms of, of you know, our perception of what women ought to be doing and those kinds of things. And then, uh, you know, all these other things, racial profiling, um, you know, by the uh, the local, the state, the federal policing agencies. Um, you know, so people living in constant fear and, and even people who are U.S. citizens being harassed on the regular basis. And, and, and then, you know, we have, they have, we're telling us about this um, new uh, set of laws in Texas alone, Operation Lone Star, that is giving grants of like $3 million to very small communities to police immigration issues. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, local police officers who have nothing to do with federal law and federal immigration are 
enticing people and trapping people and then in, in putting them in jail and then they aren't getting access to, to legal counsel. I mean, the layers are, are so complex and every piece of the community with a whole separate set of issues. So, you know, I could go on for days and days, but, but issues about, you know, um, gendered employment, child employment, um, you know, sexual harassment, sexual violence, trafficking, um, you know, there, there are just um, many, many issues facing their community at this time. And, and yet, you know, we were saying as we were down there, the, the incredible um, optimistic strength of, of that community is, is a wonder to behold. I, I don't know how they can, they can, you know, get up in the morning and persist, and yet they do, and they have for, for generations. So it, it's, um, you know, many faceted. Incredibly complex. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we're going to wrap up with one quick final question mm -hmm. for you all. Um, what message would you all leave for today's girls? Be strong. Like, just know you're amazing. Know that you're unstoppable. Um, girls can. I have girls, girl mom, and I tell them you can. You know, I encourage them. They fall down. It's okay. Get up. Try again. You can do this. And so just have that un undefeated mentality. You can do it. Thank you. And I would add to that, don't let anyone else define you. You define yourself. And all the negativity that you hear, all the people who are saying you can't, don't let them tell you that. You do what you can do. When I talk to people who have risen to really high levels, they all have stories where a teacher or a, somebody in, in their community or neighborhood told them they weren't good enough, and yet they were good enough. And somehow they found it within themselves to, to persist. So persist. Don't let anyone tell you who you are. I like that. Um, I guess I would add, I would say to young girls, young women, to strive to be the flower that blooms mm -hmm. as opposed to the flower that dies. And kind of what they said is, it is very important who waters you, who's around you, mm -hmm. the soil that you're in. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, it's quite possible you don't have that in your environment, um, in your family, but you can seek that help somewhere else. Um, especially with technology now. Gosh, I remember growing up not being able to, you have to write letters and you don't have to do that now. You could just email, social media. So if you need something, get it. But strive to be the flower that blooms, whatever that means for you, as opposed to shrinking yourself in any environment. Wow. Great positive way to end this show. Um, again, thank you all so very much for joining us. Um, we at Webster Speaks would like to thank our guests again, our audience, as well as our sponsors for joining us. This broadcast is available on demand at webster.edu forward slash Webster Speaks. Again, that's webster.edu forward slash Webster Speaks. We will see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>